let's take a look at the team stats and individual player stats, analyze those real quick. Um, it was pretty even across the board if you look at the team stats. We did excel in the rushing department, 101 rushing yards, and for the first time, it wasn't because of Daniel Jones. We also held the Bucks to 81 rushing yards, which is uh, is great because that Rojo Leonard Fournette combination ain't too shabby and that offensive line is pretty decent. Uh Buccaneers have allowed 100 rushing yards for the first time in their last 14 games. Their 13 game streak was the longest in team history. So the fact that we were going up against, you know, I and what I said last week, this is a top 10 top 5 defense, maybe even a top 1 defense in a lot of car- categories, top 3 at least. And so I didn't think that we were going to be able to run the ball, I didn't think we we're going to be able to move the ball, pass the ball, anything. And the fact that we got 101 rushing yards and Wayne Gallman was a big part of that is really good to see, especially with Will Hernandez out due to COVID and having Shane Lemieux inserted into the lineup. But yet he still had a shitty PFF grade. What is pro football focus looking at? We allowed, we did allow three sacks, but we did get two. The Giants defense is uh, two or more sacks in each of their first eight games of season, the first time since 2011. Does that ring a bell? 2011 went nine and seven, went to the Super Bowl and we beat Tom Brady. So repeat. Pass block grades, and this is what I was talking about, pro football focus. The pass block grades and pressures allowed by the Giants rookies last night. Matt Parrott played, uh, I think, 34, 32% of snaps. There were 14 snaps in which he had to do pass blocking, and he allowed zero pressures. Good on you, Matt Parrott. Uh, Andrew Thomas, the much maligned Andrew Thomas, 49 pass blocking snaps, only four pressures, so it's 65.7 grade. And then Lemieux has the same amount of pass blocking snaps, 49. He allowed one more pressure than Andrew Thomas, but had a 12.1 pass block grade. What the fuck is that about? His overall grade was 34.3. So obviously he's doing better in the run game, but I don't, what, I mean, I've gone cross-eyed. His seven penalties were killer. And I can tell you right off the bat, the holding call on Zeitler that, that, that prevented us from going further into the red zone, that was bullshit. You had the Isaac Yidem personal foul, 15 yards. That was bullshit. You have the non-pass interference call on the two-point conversion. I mean, I can name, of those seven penalties, I'd say probably half were just not called correctly. Daniel Jones, 25-41, 256, two touchdowns, two interceptions. Great throw to Deion Lewis. Great throw to Golden Tate. Not so great interceptions. Uh, Justin Pennick of Talking Giants said that uh, Daniel Jones' average time before the release in the first half is 2.14 seconds. Talk about efficiency being decisive and Jason Garrett having his best half yet as a play caller. Uh, ditto. True that. True that. Next Gen Stats said this is the only the second game of Jones' career with a pressure rate below 25%. Tonight it was 22.2%. But yet Shane Lemieux has a 12.1 pass block grade. What the hell is going on here? Pro football focus. Jones has been the most pressured quarterback since entering the NFL in 2019 with a 39.3% pressure rate in his career. And that was entering the game. Uh, Justin Pennick also said how the Giants were moving the ball in the first half, genuinely put a smile on my face, utilizing pre-snap motion, boom, play action, boom, high tempo, no, auto, no huddle, boom, and quick release in the face of the blitz. All great stuff. Jason Garrett finally put Jones in position to succeed, but Jones failed. Yeah, not his most accurate game. And then the two bad decisions. Art Stapleton said that against the same Tampa Bay defense and just a comparison of the numbers and the performance, not of the players. <laughs> Got a nice little qualifier there. Aaron Rodgers in week six against Tampa. 16 of 35, 160, two interceptions, zero touchdowns. Daniel Jones in week eight against the Bucks, 25 of 41, 256, two touchdowns, two interceptions. So for everyone calling for Daniel Jones head, are you going to call for Aaron Rodgers head? Because you should. Golden, Golden Tate, one of one for 18 yards uh, and what was many have called the longest developing trick play of all time. Wayne Gallman, 12 carries, 44 yards and a touchdown. Wayne Gallman's touchdown in the second quarter gave the Giants an 11-point lead, which was their largest lead in their five non-divisional games this season. And we still couldn't hold on to it. I'm wondering what kind of a fucking lead we need to win in games because 11 points ain't going to cut it. It's got to be like 21 or more. And even then, it's gonna it's gonna be a nail biter. So this is what I was talking about. Daniel Jones only three carries for twenty yards. I feel like there were a couple times where there was an RPO and he just he he handed it off and it's like Daniel, you had so much territory and lawn in front of you, so much green. Give it give it a go, my brother. Daniel Jones has surpassed Fran Tarkenden for the most rushing yards by a Giants quarterback in a single season in the Super Bowl area. Area era. Hello. Of course, Evan Engram with the uh, obligatory one carry for nine yards. <laughs> sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. 
Stanley Shepard had a day, 10 targets, 8 catches, 74 yards, no touchdowns though. Evan Ingram had a bit of a bounce back game, 10 targets, but only 5 catches, 61 yards. He has become the 6th tight end in Giants history with 2,000 or more career receiving yards. And I mean, when he was drafted, I put out a, a blog post about the greatest tight ends in Giants history, and I felt like he could be the number one tight end in Giants history. And maybe that can still happen. Maybe it's like, you know, it takes you four or five years to get your act together. Darius Slayton, nine targets, only five catches, 56 yards. We still got to work on that catch rate. I think a lot of the times, you know, numbers can be deceiving. I think you can attribute sometimes this catch rate to the fact that Jones dislikes him a lot and will d- default to him when shit gets hot and hairy. Ew. And then Golden Tate. He's become the storyline this week, unfortunately. Three targets. Three. Two catches, 31 yards, and a touchdown. I mean, I said it before. Is it it like, would you rather him have Shep's numbers? Like eight catches, but no touchdowns? Or would you rather have two catches, one touchdown? You got to put points on the board. I can kind of see where Golden Tate is coming from. We talked about the Joe Georgia report, that play to Ingram in the flat. where He gets down to like the one or two yard line. Tate had his hand up and was open. There was another play where I saw him open. So he's open. Not very often, but he's open. So I'd say maybe design more plays for him. Maybe he's falling out of favor. I don't know. New York Post said he was not, Golden Tate was not targeted by Daniel Jones during the first three quarters on Monday. I I find that hard to believe because he was on the interception. And that was in the third quarter. Unless I'm, I guess maybe it was the fourth quarter. And the, the one trick play is not a target, so. Yeah, maybe they're right. After Tate made the first catch early in the fourth, Tate looked at the Giants' sideline and said, throw me the damn ball. Ooh, that's probably not going to go over well, Joe Judge. And later he made the the uh, that circus touchdown catch and yelled, throw me the ball into the camera. He played just 54% of the offensive snaps against the Bucks. Not great, but, uh, you know, uh, given how successful they were, relatively speaking, you know, against the average, not successful, but in terms of how how we define success on the Giants' offensive side of the ball, maybe that's what percentage he should be playing. Because when you have Caden Smith and Levine Toilolo and Evan Ingram in there and with Slayton and Shepard back, that's a nice little mix. I don't know how Tate fits into that. And because of his actions, you know, uh, demanding the ball and such in the public eye like that, um, he was told to stay home from practice Wednesday. There's disciplinary action from Joe Judge, jury and executioner. I agree with him. He needs more targets, and uh, they need to get a little more creative with how they how they're calling plays designed for him. It's it's apparent to me that they have play designs specifically for Evan Ingram to get him the ball in space and get running. It seems that they have the correct plays in place for for Darius Slayton. I really like, you know, like I mentioned, Shepard on the whip route and on the double move and all that. Where is that for Golden Tate? I'm just not seeing it yet. And when he does get open, Jones is not seeing him. So he just doesn't have that kind of connection with him that he does with uh, with Shepard and Slayton. And with Angram, it's just like, you know, he's probably been being told ad nauseum throughout the week, we've got to get the ball to Ingram. We've got to get the ball to Ingram. So he tends to force it to him. Matt Parrott played 32% of offensive snaps. Like I mentioned, Eli Penny, only three snaps. Kind of weird, you know? There was, a, I know I'm, I sound like a broken record, but like all these, let's talk about hog mollies and ground and pound, all this, and your fullback's only playing three snaps. And I get it. The Bucks have a great run defense. But you look at what happened when we were deep in our own territory, that one, that one play action to Eli Penny where he picks up 11 yards. There's you have that option. So even though if you're not going to run, you still have the play action to him that's going to pick up some significant yardage. So three snaps is way too is just not enough in my in my HO on defense. Jabril Peppers uh, led the team in tackles with uh, nine solos, one assist. Blake Martinez had six solos, three assists, uh, and the one tackle for loss. Uh, Nick Filato tweeted that through eight games, Blake Martinez ranks number one in stops with 38, according to Pro Football Focus. Levante David of the Bucks ranks number two with 33. So, I mean, that's been a win all around. 
in Bradbury, even though he had a kind of a step back this week. I think he and Martinez have been uh, crucial signings, and I just hope, you know, I hate, hate to repeat myself, but I just hope they don't, it doesn't turn out like it did after 2016 with Snacks, Jackrabbit, and Ovi, where it's like all three of those dudes had really good years in 2016 and then just fell off the fucking planet in 2017 and were traded in 2018. So hopefully that doesn't happen here. I get a, I get a different sense from like I, I I liked snacks, but you could tell like with Ovi and 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 Jenkins like and maybe this is what Gettleman was talking about clubhouse guys and you know you you see Martinez talk in post game pressers and he just it just it feels different and I haven't seen Bradbury talk but maybe he's the silent type you know. Isaac Yidem made the start at uh, CB2, second corner position. And what I what I found happening a lot, and this happened in the Philly game as well, is I think early on when uh, in the early part of drives, the Giants opt to play soft zones because they don't want to get beat deep. And I think Joe Judge even mentioned that in the Joe Judge, Joe Judge report. And then once it gets to crunch time in their own territory, they tend to man up because they have the boundaries to play with as the extra defender. So Isaac Yidem, I was like not crazy about him, just like willy-nilly giving up 10, 12, 15 yards of catch in the first half. But it seemed like when he went to man, he was able to uh, to provide some pretty close coverage, tight coverage. So I don't know, maybe he is the answer. Oh, and that penalty on fucking Logan Ryan, which I, I guess they did. Did they not end up calling that? I think they didn't end up calling it. But at the same time, receiver did not pick up the first down. And the fact that we didn't challenge it was stupid because they just automatically awarded the Bucks the first down there. Um, Leonard Williams, one solo, three assists, and a sack. And then this, is, this kind of blew my mind. Kyler Frackrell who I can never pronounce his fucking last name, Kyler Fackrell, played 91% of defensive snaps and had one assist. What? I, 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 don't, I can't really grasp what's happening. How does that happen? Is like, are the Bucks scheming to Fackrell and, and like <laughs> incapacitating him? Like what? How does that even happen to have one assist to tackle 91% of snaps, dude? And then I thought this was interesting too. J- Jabal Sheard. So we trade Marcus Golden. We don't have O'Shane Zimenez. I guess the belief is that Cam Brown and Carter Coughlin are not ready for every day, every more snaps. Like Cam Brown had six and Carter Coughlin had four snaps. So they bring in Jabal Sheard off the streets and he plays 49% of snaps, almost half the snaps on defense. And I think me. Maybe he had a tackle. Very weird. Um, and also the other guy we brought up, Harris. He got a bunch of snaps. I don't think he had any tackles either. Very interesting. Corey Ballantyne had zero snaps on defense, and that's kind of what happens, man. You get you get opportunities. You got to take advantage of them, and then it, it's unfortunate because there's so many young guys on this team, average age 25, and the the expectations are so high for a lot of this young talent to develop quickly and if you if you aren't hitting a certain pace you're just you get written out of the script sucks brady was 28 to 40 279 two touches starting quarterbacks age 23 or younger are now 1 in 13 versus tom brady since 2017 including the playoffs <laughs> so that's a stat i would have loved to have before this game not that it would have changed my prediction <laughs> Tom Brady is now 33 and 42 in games when trailing at halftime. It's the third highest win percentage in such games in the Super Bowl era, minimum of 50 starts. So uh, I guess the way the, the outcome, the way things turned out makes sense. And then Tom Brady has never lost to a one win team in week eight or, or later in this career. So all the, all the chips were against us. Leonard Fournette had 15 carries for 52 yards. Ronald Jones, seven carries for 23 yards. So we held the running game in check and, you know, Brady didn't look, terribly confident there were like two drives where it was like whoa he's just in fucking he's in he's in uh beast mode and we'll get to beast mode talking a little bit spoiler teaser mike evans five catches 55 yards on a touchdown on seven targets he had more receiving yards versus the giants than he had in his last two games combined <laughs> and then gronk four catches 41 yards 
on four targets and a touchdown. Gronk has one or more receiving touchdowns in three straight games for the first time since uh, week six through eight of 2016. Speaking of 2016, Jaden Mickens, eight targets, five catches. Yeah, eight different receivers caught a ball for for Brady, while uh, nine different receivers caught a ball for Daniel Jones, which in Madden, you get like bonus points. I don't know if they still do it in Madden because I haven't played Madden since I don't know when. But I know back in the day, you used to get like bonus points towards your profile if you hit like more than seven different receivers in a game. So defensively for the Bucks, Jason Pierre-Paul, who said he was going to come in and demolish the Giants, didn't get the sense from watching the game. I mean, he was mostly contained in the first half, I feel like. In the second half, he started to make some big plays, but I don't feel like he dominated us or crushed us. Yes, there was that um, the pass to Shepard. Is it Shepard or Gallman? Yeah, it was Shepard. On, along the left sideline where if Jason Pierre-Paul doesn't trip him up, Shepard's probably gone for six. So that's a huge game-saving play, saving a touchdown there. And then uh, two tackles for loss and a sack. So, yeah, in the second half he started to come to life, but I don't think he, like, he made his presence known, but I don't know that he can, like, completely control the game. He also got blown up by Caden Smith on one play. Yeah, he, he wasn't looking. Okay, I'll give you that. Devin White also had five solos, two assists, and a sack. Devin White has five sacks in his last three games, two and a half sacks in his previous 18 career games. So you're getting him involved in the pass rush a little bit more. And then Ndamukong Su also had a sack. So, I mean, considering the defense, I mean, look at these names. JPP, Devin White, Ndamukong Su, some big names. And the fact that we were put, able to put up uh, 23 and probably should have had more is a testament to how much we're developing. So even though we are 1-7 and seven, and we've been 1-7 in seven, two of the past three seasons or something like that, and we can continue to lose ball games, we're not losing by more than a touchdown or double digits like we were last year or the year before. It just feels different. I believe in Joe Judge, and I believe in Daniel Jones, as Deion Sanders would say. Buccaneers defense has one or more interceptions in seven consecutive games in a single season for the first time since 2004. The Bucs are set up for a pretty decent run at this damn Lombardi. I think the Saints just don't have it this year. They're skating by. No Michael Thomas. Breeze, not. I mean, Brady's it just appears to be you know, from an outsider's perspective, to be throwing the ball better than Breeze. And the Saints are kind of escaping with wins. So I think the Bucks take the South. 